Welcome everyone. My name is Stan Barber from the Greglers ERG and I'm here to host a discussion with uh, author Susan Golden who who is uh, from uh, Stanford. She holds a doctor of science in health sciences from Harvard University School of Public Health. She attended the Harvard Business School's program for management development uh, and the Stanford Distinguished Careers Institute. Uh, she also holds a master's in public health from Boston University Medical School. Today, she works as a lecturer at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and is an adjunct professor, professor at the Stanford School of Medicine. She is director of DCIX at the Stanford Distinguished Careers Institute. Uh, in her long and varied career, she has worked in venture capital, public health, and in life sciences, which has given her a multi-dimensional, multidisciplinary perspective on longevity opportunities, and that's going to be a key part of what we talk about today. Susan, welcome to Talks at Google. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. I'm glad you're here as well. Um, for those of you who haven't been to a virtual Talks at Google event, um, you will have an opportunity to submit your questions through the YouTube uh, application. And when we get to those at the end of the talk, we'll try and take them and answer as many questions as we can. Uh, so I think it's time for us to get started. So Susan, take it away. All right. Thank you so much. I'm here to talk to you today about what I think is one of the most fascinating changes in our society and about the new demographic fact that people are going to be living much, much longer. Um, I'm going to be t t talking to you about uh, a book that I've written and about a fascinating research that I've been involved in over the last few years and uh, hope you'll enjoy uh, learning about it. If we were all in a room together, I would either have you raise hands or we uh, to tell me what age do you think you'll live to? And um, I think I've given the, the answer away, but just want to give you the stats that most people traditionally have thought of themselves living into their 60s or 70s or 80s. We were talking earlier before this, that social security was always tied to the 60s because that's when average life expectancy uh, was at that time when it was created. Um, but in fact, people are gonna be living much, much longer. And then I would also be asking you um, simultaneously to, to what are your perceptions about when someone uh, becomes old? And this is important to the discussion we're gonna be having today going forward. Uh, all this is about the fact that babies today are gonna live well into their 100s. And this will require a new way of thinking about virtually everything that you consider part of your life. And if you're currently 65 or your parent is and in good health, um, you have more than a 50% chance living well into your 90s right now. And this is due to fantastic public health measures, improvements in medical care. Um, of course, we're gonna to need to talk about COVID because that did disrupt lifespan significantly in the last few years. But it is a, a, some, a demographic shift that is now impacting everything in business, in consumer spending. And now we know that older adults are going to be significant players in the economy going forward with 53% of all consumer spending done by those 50 and older and 47% of all wealth being owned by those 50 and older. Yet most businesses still target the 18 to 34 year old demographic, not appreciating this enormous opportunity from a, a business standpoint and, and from a service standpoint. And so to be part of what is now what we're calling longevity literacy, people need to understand that people are gonna be living longer lives. They're gonna be on average 23, 20 to 30 years longer than those of your grandparents. Most don't know how to plan for it. And it's gonna impact your life, your work, your finances, your family, your career, virtually everything that you consider part of the constructs of your life. And I'm here to give you some guidance on how to begin thinking about that individually, and also how to think about that for the companies that you work in and the companies you might create going forward. So here's some key demographic changes. 10,000 people are turning 65 each day in the US. In 2035, in just a few short years, people over 65 are gonna outnumber those under 18. And modern aging is finally being recast as a vibrant opportunity, not just a problem to be solved. I'm sure you've heard terms like gray tsunami, silver tsunami. Um, we really want to educate people that this is there's a tremendous upside to aging. And there's also an imperative among all of us to help people 
not only live a longer life, but with dignity and meaning and purpose. So every individual is going to need to develop their own longevity strategy. And here are some key components to it. It's going to require lifelong learning. If you're going to live to 100, if you're going to work well into your 80s and, and beyond, your education in your 20s and 30s is not going to be sufficient. You're going to be, want to be a lifelong learner. Um, we often call this continuous learning, or uh, and it's going to be essential. And you're going to want to work longer. You may not want to work sequentially for 60 years. You might want to take career breaks for rejuvenation, for caregiving, for upskilling. But people are going to work much longer than what's been known as the traditional retirement age. And you're going to want to understand the impact of a longer life, not only on your career, but on your finances and planning. You're going to want to institute longevity wellness practices, not when you hit 65, but well in advance and keep that going. And most significantly, this is the research that's come out in the last few years, is having a purpose and having a community are two of the essential ingredients to longer life. In fact, loneliness has been estimated to uh, be the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of its reduction on your health and on your lifespan. And not only will you need a longevity strategy, but most companies are going to need one. Older adults, 55 and older, are going to be the largest growth in the workforce. Strategies for how you're going to handle a multi-generational workforce. Right now we have four generations and sometimes five in, in many uh, companies. And that creates new dynamics and, and more importantly, more opportunities. Um, you're going to want to help your uh, employees understand the impact of this on their life. And it's been shown that mixed age teams can be more productive than same age teams. And in turn, you can, that mixed age team can help generate multi-generational products and services, not just targeting that 18 to 34 year old segment, but a much broader segment of the population. And traditionally, a lot of us were taught that there's three stages to life. There's your learning years, your earning years, and then retirement. But this is no longer makes sense if you're going to live to 100. If you retire in your 60s, you're going to need to do something far more productive than waiting for 40 years. And this has now become a multi-stage life. And that's why I've created the concept that we need to be thinking much more about what stage you're in and not what age you're in. Um, there's a great diversity in adults over 60 or over 70, whatever segment you want to pick, but they're not all frail, elderly, and declining. There, there's quite a lot of vibrancy. In fact, this got emphasized during COVID when we saw many um, leaders, including Anthony Fauci, who's well over 80, um, leading the way on, on COVID response. We saw many physicians coming back out of practice and nurses and teachers to come in and help um, during the COVID years. So people will be living a multi-stage life courses with the new life stages that I'm going to be talking to you about. And think about your own stages um, when, when we think through this, and then your customers and your workforce. And ultimately, we're going to be encouraging people to market and advertise to stage and not stereotype, stereotype people by their age. And I want to show you what one company has done to recognize um, the stage approach to life, which is LinkedIn just in this past year for the first time enables users to add uh, an option that shows that they've had a, a career break. And you can define what your career break was for, for caregiving or for upskilling or for rejuvenation with a, a range of alternative job titles for that for that uh, time period. That this is going to be valued. Having career breaks is going to be a valued part of a hundred year life. It'll be an essential tool. And I want to also introduce the concept of why ageism is an important factor in the 100 year life because ageism exists. It can be very subtle. But as one professor at uh, the business school tells us, why is ageism considered the last acceptable ism? It's not often included in diversity initiatives. Um, and we know that there's an impact of ageism and words that are used on an individual's health. And there are a lot of myths out there about older workers. One of the great myths is that older workers are more costly and don't add value. But that's absolutely been proven to be, not be true. Uh, MRSA, uh, as a research organization, has documented that older workers' turnover is far less and they tend to um, stay in, in the workforce much longer uh, if it's their choosing. And they do add value and that uh, they don't cost more uh, because there's not as much turnover. And then often there's a myth that older workers struggle with technology and new skills. And in fact, 
older workers want to be taught new technology and new skills. They may need to be taught slightly differently at different times, but those are myths that um, impact ageism in the workforce. And I encourage all of you who are managers to uh, look at a great report that's issued about MRSA, which is looking at um, your next stage. Are you age ready in the workforce for older adults uh, being part of it? And marketing and advertising becomes another key, key uh, component of ageism. And I love this photo because it really uh, defies the stereotype there, that an older adult is, you know, all of them are all frail, elderly and declining. Um, so the people are living much more vibrant stages of their life from 50 and older and well into their 90s. Um, this is another one of my favorite uh, marketing images of somebody truly enjoying life and music and all there is in life and not trying to stereotype, you know, wrinkled, get uh, all the wrinkles out of a photo to depict somebody. So what images we use and also what words we use really matter. So there are initiatives underway right now, uh, both here in San Francisco, um, nationwide and worldwide to address ageism. This was a campaign that was started right before the uh, pandemic in, in 2019, where billboards and backs of buses had these different images of older adults showing the, the vibrancy of these people and, and their assets. They can, they're leaders, leaders, they're creative, they're courageous, they're intelligent, they're passionate, but they're, all these are uh, images of older adults. And there are a couple of organizations that are doing some really phenomenal work trying to end ageism by changing the narrative, changing how people think and talk and act about aging and ageism. And this will be very important in a society where people are living 100 years of lives so that people are not segmented and are not, and not discriminated against in, uh, because of their age. Um, and words matter. And people have been struggling now that people are living longer. What should these words be to describe somebody? We don't want to use senior anymore universally. We don't want to use elderly. And so I did a project where we try to collect all the different words that are being used out there. And I don't think we've come up with the right ones yet. And I invite all of you who are out there, to, if you think of a great word, um, promote it. I'll tell you some of the words that I'm starting to use. But it's the idea that people are in this new stages of life, not just one stage, but multiple stages, where there's a lot of vibrancy and activity and uh, looking forward, and it's not just old age as one concept. Um, so we need new frameworks, and some of the new words that you're going to hear me talk about, one is called a sidepreneur. It's people who are starting entrepreneurial endeavors in addition to their current jobs. Some people are using the term olderpreneur for the older uh, entrepreneur out there. Um, I'm not in love with that term, but it, it captures what I'm trying to say, which is people can be creative and vibrant at all stages of life. And uh, one term that I'm starting to use more is that the, we're in a renaissance stage and a friend of mine is starting to use, has her signature, uh, she's a renaissance woman. But the key is that we're going to be living a multi-stage life course, new ways for media um, to communicate with older adults will be essential. And we need to start thinking about going forward and not declining, thinking of everybody as sort of ending their life when they hit the 60s or 70s or 80s, but they're actually going further. And so I've come up with a term again, a made up one, but to capture all this, calling it furtherhood. So what is furtherhood? And from my standpoint, it's modern aging as a vibrant opportunity, not just a problem to solve. It's reimagining all the different ways a hundred year life will affect the life course. It means having a healthier, more fulfilling life and living your life with dignity and meaning and purpose. And it also furtherhood implies that we're gonna, there's an overwhelming need for innovative solutions, access and affordability. And I'm hoping at the end of this talk, some of you will be inspired to um, create some of those innovative solutions. It's a new gift. It's not old age, it's not retirement age, it's not the age of impairments, which is how people traditionally have thought about um, aging. And it's importantly redefining your own purpose through many further stages of life. You may have done one thing and been excited about one thing at a certain stage of your life, but you may want to rethink your life priorities and repurpose that. And you're going to want to evaluate how you contribute your wisdom and your values and your experience to the next generations. Mentoring, I think, is going to become an essential uh, component of almost every older adult's life. They will um, benefit from it from a reverse mentoring standpoint as well. 
And then I also envision this is going to be having a portfolio of opportunities. You may not want to be doing just one single thing throughout the different stages of your uh, life, but having a portfolio of things that you engage with. So to help understand all these changes and uh, all that it's going to involve in terms of our thinking, I've created a framework called what I call the five quarter life framework. And I know it's funky math. I, I know that there are four quarters a year. Um, traditionally in a business uh, setting or at Stanford, there were four quarters um, in, in the school year. But I wanted to convey that we don't know what the 100 year plus air, uh, time frame looks like. So I've called that an extra quarter because that's something that's still being defined. But think about the first part of your life, somewhere between birth to th your 30s as your starting quarter. This is where you're learning and, and um, trying new things and uh, launching maybe your first career. And then you uh, emerge into your second quarter, which I consider the growing quarter, somewhere between 25 and 55. This is why, when you might be starting a family, you might be buying a home at, during this time, you might be switching careers, you might be involved in continuous learning. And the third quarter, uh, which is the one that I think is particularly new in our lives, is somewhere between 55 to 85. And again, these time age frames, are very variable, but this is the renaissance year when there's a lot that's gonna be new and exciting for um, older adults. And then at some point we are all gonna hit our legacy years and that will vary um, uh, where we are rethinking you know, um, what's next and getting ready to, at some point to, uh, what our legacy is going to be um, at one point when we all um, pass. So the, in this quarter framework, I've uh, documented a few different stages we might be in. They're not all sequential. Not everybody's going to be going through them. But what I wanted to emphasize is that there are a couple of stages that are going to happen at different um, times in your life. You might be a continuous learner in your second quarter, and you might be it in your fourth quarter, um, and potentially in your fifth quarter, where you're going back and learning new skills uh, to create uh, new interests. And you might also be a caregiver. Uh, you might be a caregiver somewhere between 25 to 50 for your children, but you also might be a caregiver for a parent um, or a spouse. And this will also be something that you will be um, experiencing during different stages of your life. Uh, but in importantly, the third quarter where you're in a repurposing, resetting your life priorities, um, where I consider this sort of your renaissance years, a chance to grow in new ways that you might not have imagined. And research has shown that the happiest uh, age of most adults has been in their 70s. And that just gives them a freedom to do many new things that they may not have uh, anticipated. Um, so this is one that I think that uh, to focus on as you think about uh, as an older adult, as an opportunity and not, not a problem to be solved. And I thought it was interesting that when Serena Williams announced that she's planning to evolve away from tennis, she was creating a new stage, the evolution stage. She's not retiring. She knows she wants to go on and do many new things. And so she's evolving. And I thought that was a, a wonderful new term to add to the mix. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about just how some companies are using this type of framework, using a stage approach to marketing um, to their uh, consumer and how it has helped them have a very vibrant and growing business. One is Merrill Lynch. The financial services industry was the first to recognize that people are gonna need a lot more money um, if they're gonna live a hundred year life. And Merrill Lynch uniquely understood that people have different life priorities at different stages of their life and that their wealth management advisors should be catering their portfolio needs based on what that person's life priorities are. And they've chosen these seven um, paradigms for what are the life priorities for their clients. And every year they reassess them with them. And they've even trained their own wealth managers to do this for themselves. It's an important way to look at their stage approach and, and has been a very successful. And another company, which many of you might be familiar with, is Warby Parker, who was traditionally known as the hipster brand for eyewear. Um, they came in with a, a wonderful product that's uh, cost much less than traditional prescription uh, eyeglasses. But after they uh, were in business for a number of years, they realized they were missing out on an older adult market um, who need progressives, which are often also quite expensive. But instead of developing framework, uh, eyewear that's specific for older adults with frames that 
kind of scream older adult here. They used the same frames, the hipster brand of Warby Parker, and it became a multi-generational product, but they now offer uh, progressive lenses uh, to older adults. And it accounts for more than 30% of their revenues. So it's a, a company that now has multi-generational customers, a multi-generational product, um, and their business has grown as a result of it. And another uh, example, and it might be one that you might not think of as an important uh, area of business opportunity in the longevity market are all the different needs associated with end of life planning and dying. It's very complicated to uh, get all the financial documents, all the legal documents you're gonna need for advanced directives, advanced care planning, what, what are your preferences are. And a company recognized this, a company called Kate got started um, out of Boston area that would help people have a platform, a one-stop shopping to get all their needs uh, met related to end of life planning, loss and grief, um, all, all the tools that they're gonna need, contracting with uh, legal advisors if needed, funeral homes, uh, all of that goes with it. And it, they've been enormously successful in part because of Google, their, their main uh, tool for getting customers is search. And uh, it, this is a, an example I want to tell you a bit more later why we need more platforms for the longevity market like Cake. Cake is dedicated to end of life planning, but uh, it is a, an instrument that could be expanded for many of the different needs related to um, long life and, and longevity. Then there are some non obvious domains. Financial services make sense. Uh, eyeglasses, um, death and dying, but you may not have thought about some of these that, that are part of what every consumer facing industry should be rethinking. Food and nutrition, enormous opportunities. Dating platforms, helping people transition and plan for different careers at different stages of their life. Ways to address purpose and social isolation and loneliness. Um, creating uh, ways to get people uh, mentored from different generations and putting older uh, together with younger. There are a couple of initiatives and companies in this area, but this is gonna be an essential tool. Travel, entertainment, and leisure are all uh, related to what older adults will want and will be different. And you will need to segment um, by what stage they're in. If they're, they can be an active traveler, um, more passive traveler, um, same thing on clothing and accessories. We've seen Nike as one company that created a new line of product for older athletes um, who they now, uh, refer to as uh, athlete forever. And one of the really important ones, and I'm glad to say that um, uh, Google has been in the forefront of this, is helping people be digitally literate. There is no way you're going to be a successful 100 year per life ager without having uh, digital literacy. You're gonna need it for your finances, for your food delivery, for your transportation. And we needed it certainly for uh, Zoom connections during COVID for uh, community and uh, purpose. And Google has an initiative together with the Older Adult Technology Services Organization and ARP to provide free digital literacy to underserved populations, which is just fantastic to see. And we're gonna need more of that throughout this country. But we have to also recognize the impact of COVID-19 because it's not all been perfect for older adults. There was a dramatic decrease in life expectancy of the last two years, on average two years less uh, overall for the entire country. And then we know that certain types of older adults were more isolated, particularly those um, related to when they needed caregiving. And it, would, it created new important conversations about caregiving, some of which I want to uh, address today. And it is also, in the upside, impacted where we work, um, where we live, and how we learn, and, and increase the acceptance of telehealth. So this has created sort of a new type of tech that's being referred to as age tech and aging in place um, to support older adults living longer, working and, and learning in different ways. Um, and another domain in this area is now called longevity fintech. It's helping people plan financially for longevity specifically, not just retirement, but for longevity, which is different. And a new term that I'm not yet totally comfortable with, but death tech, as, as an example, Cake, one of the companies dealing with the planning for death market, but there's new types of uh, 
burial services, uh, what they're calling green burial services, new types of palliative care services, there's death doula, and all of these uh, have a technology component to them. And telehealth and digital health will be a very important domain going forward to support healthy longevity. This is one of the outcomes of the COVID-19 pandemic that telehealth became adapted and now adopted and reimbursed. And I think this is gonna uh, be a very important tool for older adults to age successfully. But I did wanna bring in one uh, other topic that is a traditional older adult market topic and that's caregiving. And caregiving is not only just something you receive, but it's also a stage of life, as I mentioned. And in the United States, this has uh, been on the burden on 53 million older adults in particular who are providing caregiving um, to someone. And this has grown um, over the last few years that nearly one in five are providing unpaid care to an adult with health or functional needs. And most people don't understand that Medicare does not cover in-home care, and therefore the burden has been on, um, on unpaid caregivers. This has become so significant in the United States, particularly during COVID, as we recognize that 61% of today's family caregivers are women, 61% are working and juggling often work and their own children and taking care of an older adult. And a number of uh, organizations and thought leaders have recognize the importance of this, including Pivotal Ventures, which is the Melinda French Gates uh, incubation and investment company to support innovations for caregivers of older adults. They support a accelerator in Washington, DC, and I'm one of their thought leader partners. And a year ago, I put out a report at their request on the landscape of caregiving innovations. How, what's happening? Why are there companies that are um, not able to succeed? Why are there companies that are succeeding? And how can we get more solutions to these 53 million unpaid caregivers? Because it's a very challenging journey. One of the things that we learned is that there's an overwhelming number of choices for any caregiver. In the beginning, they go through an information journey. And here's just a sample, a very small sample of all the wonderful resources that are out there that they often find in a Google search but there's no way to link them all together. That if you're in one website that you would know about the next website or the next tool that would help you if you're dealing with someone with um, dementia or Parkinson's or pulmonary disease or has just come home from the hospital discharge with uh, oxygen. And the same way, there's a lot of great assessment tools out there to tell you this is what, what stage your caregiver is in and this is what stage the care recipient is in. But again, a lot of people don't know about these um, types of solutions. And there are a lot of great providers there who are providing concierge services or support to help you um, during this time as a caregiver. But most people just don't know about them. And the companies are not able to easily find the caregivers. Caregivers can't find them. So one of the recommendations we're making is that there really needs to be a platform a one-stop place where you go as a caregiver for free to get all this information curated for you, get a financial assessment, what's gonna be covered, and then have all the solution providers available to sh show you how they could support your work. And I'm mentioning this because those of you who know how to develop platforms or are interested in this topic or helping us uh, create a public-private partnership, I hope you'll think, uh, think about uh, working on this. We're putting out this blueprint um, in a few weeks as an open source innovation tool. We're not going to build it, but a community of uh, stakeholders hopefully will. And it's something that's really needed in this country. Other countries have this, some states have it, but we don't have a national uh, care connector uh, at this time. And this is just something that I hope going forward, um, some of you might be interested in getting connected to. Um, and then I want to just address with you about the future of, of healthy longevity and what most people I think have not recognized is how critical intergenerational engagements will be. There's a joy in intergenerational learning. When I went back to uh, the program at Stanford for a year, I was in a classroom as were all my colleagues with um, people who were older, younger than I, we are, but uh, enjoying the same stage of life. We were all uh, in our learning stage. And there is, we learn from each other. They would learn from us about our experiences um, in different companies and organizations. And we would learn from them um, about what, what they see as uh, the needs going forward. 
And we also know intergenerational teams are going to be what will make things happen better in companies, and particularly for designing new products and services for older adults. You're going to want to design with older people, not just for them. Mentoring is uh, going to be, I think, an, an essential uh, component of everybody's life. It's rejuvenating. And there was a great movie about it, uh, the intern uh, showing the reverse mentoring that was going on as well. And intergenerational housing is happening in many countries, a little bit here um, in the United States, but I think this is going to be a trend going forward. And so what kind of uh, actions can companies take um, to get ready for an age-friendly workforce and an intergenerational workforce? It might be redesigning the work environments that enable and encourage older adults to remain. It might be redesigning our educational systems to support lifelong learning and training. Um, it'll be implementing strategies to reduce ageism. It'll be supporting career breaks. And it will really matter on, on the leadership level. Uh, words will matter, marketing ad, and advertising images matter, and valuing a multi-generational workforce will really matter, and that will come from leadership. So what I would like to leave you with is the title of the um, last chapter in my book, which is, as I told you, I made up this term, furtherhood, which is a concept that I hope you'll embrace no matter what age you are, that um, staying healthy, engaged, and purposeful will be essential um, to a long life. You might want to become a sidepreneur at different stages of your life. Hopefully you might uh, be interested in creating products and services to support healthy longevity based on your own experience and your friends and your family and then um, focus groups. Um, I hope you'll hire older workers and create intergenerational teams and that you'll be a personal ambassador to address ageism um, and invest in dignity. Um, entrepreneurs and venture capital firms have been growing in their investment in this area, but really we need so much more com compared to what the opportunity is. And you're, by doing that, you're really investing in dignity. Um, so this is some information about um, my book and my uh, website, should you be interested in purchasing it. Um, my editor makes me say that. Um, but now we can take some questions. Um, and uh, love to hear from Stan and all of you. All right, thank you so much, Susan. That was a wonderful speech and uh, informing us on many and many different things I think that are related to this area. I wanted to um, start off with a couple of my questions and then I was gonna take some audience questions. One of the things uh, that the book explores are opportunities for entrepreneurs. There's many good sections in your book on that, also including what you evaluate the market opportunity in dollars to be, which I think a lot of people don't really understand. Hey, you could really make money at this if you do it well. Um, I wanted to ask if you saw any common elements in the examples that you cited that you thought were things that you thought drove success in evaluating this these opportunities. Well, de definitely the, those companies that segmented their market, not as all older adults, like everybody over 60 was the same, um, but segmenting them by what stage they were in. The example being um, Merrill Lynch, they did a great job with that. So companies that had a stage approach to marketing and, uh, and creating products and services did better. The second thing was uh, how they acquire their customer. This is the biggest challenge we found in all the companies in that report um, that I wrote last year that most companies start out wanting to go direct to consumer the way Cake did, and they were successful, but most are not. And so they wind up selling to Medicare Advantage or sometimes to employers um, for, the, for benefits. And these are great ways to distribute their product or service, but they're still missing a huge swath of the population, which is why in caregiving, I'm advocating um, that we need a caregiver marketplace. We just don't have that. And I'm hoping you know, together with various stakeholders, we can help create one. Um, but acquiring the customer is the hardest part in this. You can, uh, there's no direct channels to the consumer of older adults who need these products and services. So we, ne we need help in that way. And that's why I'm encouraging anybody who wants to create platforms. You can imagine just for all the different types of lifelong learning experiences people are going to want. There's no central place to find that. You may hear about different opportunities. You might search for a particular one, but you wouldn't know about the 10 others that might be available in your community or in your state. 
Um, so that those were some of the lessons. And then reimbursement is the other big issue. Who's going to pay for this? The, the fact is 40% of older adults don't have enough retirement savings and to last to 100 years. And so who are going to pay for these products and services? It's good that Medicare Advantage is starting to pay for many of them. Employers are providing it as a benefit. But, but we need a way to, ca to connect with those adults who don't have enough um, to get, purchase these products and services that would support their longevity. Okay. One other area that's related to this was uh, the notion, and I think this gets back to your acquiring customers problem you cite, and that's, you know, when do you depend more on locally centered organizations versus those that might have broader scope, national or perhaps uh, multi-state? Uh, how do you kind of divide the line between those two and and what do you see as being the most effective approach there? Does that question work for you? Yeah, so the, the local approach is essential uh, for caregiving services because it's uh, ever changing and there are area agencies on aging in every single state and they have a, plat a platform and a care connect type of person who can help coach you through what's available. But there are also important national organizations and national companies that can support different needs, such as a company like Wealthy, which I think it, um, has an, an established relationship with a number of the tech firms, is a care concierge service to help you navigate the complexity. Basically, what I was proposing on a national basis, they do it uh, as, a, as a paid service, and they are able to do it in every state throughout the country. In the same way that CAKE is a platform that you can use in every state. They have different um, end of life planning has different requirements in different states from a legal standpoint. They have that. So you, there are some local agencies, but where I'm thinking about the broader opportunity is not just in the service component, but in the product component, which would be na nationwide. Um, so you can imagine new tools um, that could be in your home to, to help you um, thrive, new, new learning platforms. Um, so you can imagine many different broader scopes than just something that needs to be regionally focused. Okay, Susan, we're going to take some questions from the, uh, the audience now. Um, is the challenge of climate change going to affect lifespan or population growth? Yes, um, we had, we need a lot of work in that area. Um, we can't. We will see. Uh, its impact, you know, on on life, and as you saw in the hurricanes, um, and it particularly impacts older adults who might not have, you know, the support that they need. So yes, we're going to see that. And do you see opportunities for uh, for entrepreneurs or others to play a, play a role in offering options for people in those uh, that are affected in those ways? Yes, I, absolutely. I mean, all of these are problems to be solved. You know, so fall in love with a problem and fix it. I mean, there are so many challenges um, for aging, but there's also so many opportunities. And that's uh, what we're seeing going forward. Designing homes that uh, have universal design, as an example, would be a huge uh, addition in this country. It's true in some other countries that all buildings and apartments are built with universal design, which enable people to, to live successfully in their own home. We don't have that in this country. Um, you can imagine uh, some design that would impact, you know, prevent hurricanes from impacting you more than they had. So in anticipating that people are going to want to live in their homes longer, how, how can you uh, protect them in certain ways uh, from a design standpoint? Just be an example. Yeah, I remember in your book, you had talked specifically about the fact that there were standards for improving uh, the home design from a universal point of view. And that they, they're available in the U.S., they're just not well integrated into the framework by which we build homes and stuff. Right. So there definitely is an opportunity there. I certainly see that. Um, next question, please. Could a stage, not age, be a constructive framework to defeating ageism? I hope so. I, I, instead of saying, calling somebody by an age or saying everybody over 65 is X or everybody over, you know, a certain age can't learn technology, it's just not true. So if we can use a stage approach, that's universal. You might be in the same stage as a 40 year old and an 80 year old. And there's an, an adage uh, going on in our industry right now. If you've seen one 85 year old, 
you've seen one 85 year old. I mean, there is such vibrancy and variation and this is, we should become an ageless society, not defining people by their age and, and uh, stereotyping their capabilities because they've hit a certain um, age uh, hallmark. You know, it's more important what they can do, what they can contribute and everybody can contribute something uh, no matter what stage of life they're in. One of the things I was curious about that is related to that is uh, a factor involving the multi-generational aspect, because as you said, you can be at the same stage and it's not really age dependent. It's where you are in, in your journey. Uh, but I could also see that if you did have a multi-generational environment in which you were operating, that you could learn from people at different stages in their life uh, about how to advance from where you are to a different stage, or perhaps how to enjoy the stage you're in, be more productive in that stage. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I think intergenerational is the key to longevity. I really do. And then the other thing I noticed in the book was you were also promoting the idea that the that that an improvement from a workplace point of view would be to have this multi-generational workforce be kind of the norm. Could you talk a little bit more about that? So some companies are there already and that MRSA report is uh, emphasizing, you know, get ready because this is what's going to be uh, going forward. And with the labor shortage market, it would make total sense that you would keep your older workers. You may have to retrain them in certain ways or uh, upskill them, but that's fine. They want that. Um, and they might want more flexibility over time. But having a multi-generational workforce will make it a more vibrant organization. And as I mentioned, it will help you design products and services better for an older uh, adult market. So if you are thinking that you would like to take advantage of this $22 trillion market opportunity worldwide, over eight and a half million, eight and a half trillion in the US alone, why wouldn't you want a multi-generational workforce where you, together you could be creative um, and developing solutions for the various wants and needs of older adults? All right, Susan, do we have another question? Are there differences when approaching older ages? Are there considerations that need to be made for affinity groups regarding gender and ethnicity? Pardon me, but I have to assume there can't be a one-size-fits-all. No, there, there is certainly not. There's many uh, concerns and uh, issues to be addressed um, that goes with ageism. Um, and, you know, it particularly impacts certain, as you said, segments of the population more than others. Uh, women often find that there's uh, their ageist attitudes um, addressed to them if they don't dye their hair or um, the way things are marketed to them as anti-aging skin products. Um, and all different uh, segments of, of uh, the population. So I think, yes, it, it, there need to be different approaches for different uh, segments of the market who have experienced ageism. But uh, dealing with it broadly is also important because it's there. Um, and it's subtle often, but it's very much out there. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was that there are product designers that think they understand the demands of the older market, but underestimated how older consumers could could flee any product giving off a whiff of oldness. Yes. Uh, I think that was a quote from Joe Coughlin. Yes. Um, can you talk more about that? Uh, sure. You know, and how how to best kind of approach delivering products to uh, to an, a spectrum of users without kind of having this oldness thing attached yes. to them. Um, Joe is one of the first people to coin that term and, and correctly so. And he's often said, well, what we need and have been done successfully are stealth features. You don't want something that screams older adult, like having a life alert around your neck um, screams older adult here. But having something that's very subtle inside uh, an Apple Watch is, is different. Um, it doesn't scream older adult. Uh, BMW is a company that has done this very successfully. They have the same looking wonderful car, but they created many features internally that make it more accessible for older adults. And they did that in a stealth way so that older and younger would not be able to differentiate it. But the font size might be different on the dashboard, color contrast, access into the car and seat heights. Um, these are all stealth features that enable uh, 
an older adult to enjoy the, their driving experience. And since they happen to be the majority of the consumers, it made a lot of sense for BMW to redesign some features in their car to accommodate that. I think that will be the feature pro of product design going forward or stealth features that don't show. Uh, what Joe often says is big, beige, and boring is how uh, most older adult products have been perceived and that it should be designed with and not for it as, as Warby Parker did. Their eyeglass frames look the same if you're an 18 year old or if you're an 88 year old. Yeah, that, that reminds me, you mentioned 2035 as being kind of the point where we cross over into, you know, having more people that, that are older than people who are younger. And that's also kind of the magic number that people point at is when EV adoption will be, you know, big time. Everyone will drive an EV. And um, you were just speaking towards the fact that you know, cars have got to have these features to make them more usable. It seems like that's an opportunity for EV guys to get ahead of the game by taking that demographic into account. I'm not a car designer by any means, but it's just it's an idea. It's a perfect analogy. Maybe they have already, or maybe they, they're planning to, but yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. Okay, can I have the next question? For a large company, say the auto industry, apropos to what I was just talking about, how do you approach your your 18 stage framework? It seems like a lot to address, and someone someone else I was talking to remarked about that when they read, read your book as well. That's a big number. 18 is a big number. So 18 is not some of the all the stages that everybody's going to go through. I've just put them out there. You might go through five of them. You might go through ten of them. But the concept was it's not just one stage after you hit 65. It'll be filled with a variety of things. And you'll be in these stages at different times of your life. As I said, you might be a caregiver, a learner, um, resetting your life priorities in your 30s, and again in your 40s, and then again in your 50s. It's not just something all of this happens after you're 65. So um, I hope you understood that the multi-stage life doesn't mean all 18 stages. It just means more than the three stages of learn, earn, and retire, um, that we'll be living a much more vibrant life as we age uh, through our 100s. You talked a bit about, uh, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, kind of technology's role in all of this. Uh, you alluded to the different kinds of technologies that people were actually able to apply. Um, when you look at a company like Google or any of the other big tech firms, um, are there opportunities there that we're missing today? that you think that we need to go, you know, make a, maybe take a second look at, or maybe take a product that we have that can f fit a broader framework if we made a little tweak to it. I'm not asking you to give us, you know, your, your next great idea or anything, yeah, but my next great idea, absolutely. Uh, Cause you guys can implement it better than anybody. I, I really am going to put out another plea for platforms. We really need uh, integrated ways of giving people the information and the products and the services that are out there. And to the extent you can help create platforms um, for the different needs related to longevity. As I said, there's an end of life care planning platform, but we don't have the equivalent in caregiving. We don't have the equivalent in transition planning and continuous learning in intergenerational housing. You can imagine on and on and on. All these are enormous market opportunities going forward. Um, how, do, how to be digitally literate could be as, as Google is doing with ARP right now and OATS, could become a national um, platform, again, where uh, it could be in different languages and training tools, and then how to use different Google products. Um, that would be an enormous gift to older adults to be able to train just as if they were in uh, working at, at a company that gives them that digital literacy all the time. Um, these will be an important tools for every older adult going forward. And then how, how to have how, design and plan your life. Uh, planning tools, you can imagine, um, could be important that Google could participate or tech in, in broadly. We, we don't have a lot of planning for the 100 year life. Uh, as I said, Merrill Lynch is doing this from, from some extent from a wealth management standpoint, but you, people are gonna be having 60 year career spans they don't know how to plan for that. And what will that mean? Um, and I think technology will help people do that so much better going forward. And there is a whole robotics movement. We didn't talk about that, but it's a very exciting area. Uh, one of my favorite companies is Intuition Robotics. It's a home-based robot, robot that will help you um, get information, 
and remind you to exercise, alert you if something's going on. And so that whole area of uh, integrating into the smart home will be an, an important component going forward. Yeah, I could see that, you know, things that could remind you to take this particular medication or, or kind of help you keep up with that kind of thing would, I could see, be very vital, particularly if you're in a position where that's part of your well-being to maintain that particular regimen. Um, one of the other things that really occurred to me was the emphasis you placed on the effect that COVID-19 not only had on writing your book, but in kind of uh, accentuating some of the things that people uh, were able to uh, take advantage of because they were able to be brought forward, Zoom meetings, telehealth, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, are there other significant things of that nature that you feel like could be brought to the fore because of some some of a pandemic or uh, a hurricane or something like that that maybe – uh, I'm not wishing bad things on anyone, but, you know, would help help us um, develop some of these capabilities more quickly or better yet, develop them now so they'd be ready when the next thing comes along. Well, I have a public health mindset vir about virtually everything. So I think planning and preparation is key. Uh, we were not well well prepared for a pandemic. And, and once we had the tools and knowledge uh, to help people, we weren't able to disseminate it broadly. So getting people information and empowering them with information, how to plan for their 100 year life and all the things that could go right, but also all the things that might go wrong um, would be something that I would love to see. We don't have longevity checkups right now. If you go to a doctor, no matter what age you are, mm -hmm. you're not given a longevity checkup. Uh, do you have strength training in your, has your balance? Um, how, how are all the different things you wanna protect in a hundred year life? We just don't have that. I could imagine we would um, by somebody being proactive about it, creating the tools so you could have that kind of uh, virtual assessment if it's a telehealth appointment or in-person assessment and that you become a partner in this along the way. And, and that, that was the intent behind the book as well. How do you be a partner in your own longevity as well as you know your company's uh, strategy for it? But we all are going to need personal strategies to prepare for a hundred year life and not to, for it to just happen when you turn 65 and start saying, oh, I should be thinking about X, X and X when you can't start retirement savings in your 60s um, under that umbrella of retirement savings. But what if we had longevity savings from the beginning? What if we were able to take out our 401ks for to be used towards ongoing learning without any tax penalty? All of those policies are not created yet to support the 100 year life. One other thing I wanted to uh, revisit with you was you did also talk in the talk, and you mentioned it in the book as well, that uh, people have restructured the work environments as a result of COVID-19. And part of that restructuring not only does involve work at home, which is what I'm doing here at Google, but also uh, so-called hybrid work where you're at work a few days a week and at home a few days. Uh, can you tell me more about your thoughts on that? I think, I think there's, a, there's been a great liberator for older adults by um, the concept of remote work. Um, no longer uh, can people be um, limited from working if they can't have act, can't, can't get to a place physically. And it increases the opportunity for older workers, no matter where they are, um, to participate in the workforce. It also uh, taught us all that we can work remotely, um, but I, like you, agree that there's a, an important benefit for socialization and community that comes from working in a, in a structure. And older adults, more than anybody, uh, often say what they miss most about work if they have retired out of their career is the community and the purpose. Um, so that if we can create that virtually as well, um, and I know many companies had worked hard at trying to create community even during COVID, um, but that becomes essential throughout the lifespan. Um, but it also becomes particularly essential for older adults. And people will find that they may not want to continue working in the same position or same uh, field, but they might want to evolve as Serena Williams is. Um, but everybody's going to need some sort of purpose and some sort of community um, in person as well as virtually. There are companies that will actually, uh, for older adults who are more limited in their transportation, pick you up from your home and bring you to a 
community setting where you can learn together, exercise together, uh, because they know how vital social uh, interaction and community is. And you can imagine that, you know, from a workforce standpoint as well. Okay. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to touch on uh, briefly was um, opportunities going forward uh, as we um, as we move through life for re-education. You mentioned uh, your experience going back and and uh, attending Stanford and learning with a group of people going through relearning experience at various stages of their life. Um, are there other things that, that you feel like uh, we people could spend time on in developing uh, or in taking advantage of as they exist today that could help foster that? There are many programs now, like the one that I did at Stanford. Um, University of Texas has one, Notre Dame, uh, Harvard has one. So those are immersion, basically, programs, and they're um, in person for the most part. Although during COVID, uh, part of the program that I'm connected to um, held things uh, virtually. But there are a lot of excellent virtual learning platforms that people can participate in and online uh, work webinars, workshops, certificates. The key difference, though, is to being part of a community. I would encourage anybody who's going to sign up for something, find somebody else to sign up with you. I am sure all of us have signed up to participate in a webinar, put it on our calendars, and we just don't do it. But if you're accountable, to others who are doing it with you. And the same holds often true for exercise. Um, it's much more fun. It's much more uh, interesting to learn with other people. So any of the online programs you do, if you can do them as part of a community, community that they create or one that you've created will be essential to being a lifelong learner. And it doesn't all have to be in person. There are a lot of hybrid per programs now, uh, but having your, uh, that as part of your plan that throughout your life you're going to need to be a continuous learner through 100 because it'll create vibrancy but it'll also create new opportunities for you those are great um i i know my wife in particular she's a retired teacher she uh takes advantage of those opportunities for herself now so it's it's important uh for her to have those sense of community working with others and learning together uh, in her retirement. So I, I can certainly see it happening in my own life because, you know, she's my wife. Um, anyway, um, the website for the book is stage, not age.com, right? Yes. And uh, I've been to the website. There are many places you can get the book if you would like to get it. I read it, and I encourage anyone who is uh, here at Talks with Google who has an interest in this space to read it as well. There are many facets to it, as we mentioned today. You have you know, benefits directly for you as a person going through multiple stages in your life. Uh, benefits for you as an entrepreneur, maybe looking for opportunities to make money and kind of a, a larger benefit to get back to your public health point of view saying, how can we generally make society better by taking, taking better advantage of the fact that we've got these multi-generational uh, interactions all happening all around us. Uh, some of them are maybe culturally based, some of them are education based, some of them are work based, but we need to recognize them and take advantage of all of them, uh, not only for the value that uh, people who are in that space are, are going through in their own lives, but perhaps the the uh, cross sectionality that can erupt from uh, you know people coming together and doing things uh, doing things in concert in various ways. So um, I think that uh, I'll give you some uh, moments if you have some closing remarks for us. Um, I really hope you all embrace furtherhood, uh, the concept that you're going further in your life, you're not ending your life as you get older, and that this is a vibrant uh, time to enjoy. And as a younger person, I, I hope you'll contribute your wisdom and learning to older adults and have older adults contribute their uh, wisdom and learnings to you. Um, and I want to thank my younger adult in my life, my daughter, Amanda Golden, who um, is the lead uh, leads the communications for the Google News Initiative. She, so it's my Googler there, and I want to thank her for um, introducing me to uh, Google Talks. All right, thank you, Susan. Uh, 
those of you who are listening to the live stream, if you want to get a, a copy of this off of the YouTube channel in a couple of weeks, it'll be available. And until then, I thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Stan. It was wonderful.